As we gather together today, let us greet one another in some of the languages that we speak and invite others in as they arrive. Good morning. Megalaba. Mbote. Jambo. Namaste. Maguanani. Nadama. Olege. Teriabiti. Buenos dias. Bonjour. Mwabiyue. Kajabna Ai. It is good to be with you on this marathon Sunday. I know that many of you have regaled me with stories of the routes that you had to take to get to church this morning, and I have no doubt others will be joining us as they find their way from wherever they live to this place. We would love to be able to tell you about upcoming marathons, but it seems that they spring them upon us and uh, change the route every time. And so it's a little bit more difficult than that. But we will try to get out an email every time we know that there's an upcoming marathon and hopefully at least draw attention to that for you. As we come together today, just a couple of announcements that I want to draw to your attention. The first is I want to express thanks to everybody who signed up for the LABC teams. You will see that's in the narthex again. Please, if you have yet to sign up for a team and you're able to find a home for yourself, please do so. That would be extremely meaningful. It also makes a very profound statement uh, that we are all in this together. And so please. Uh, it was great to see as many names up there, and if you are still waiting, and if you've taken home one of the uh, lists of teams to take a look at them and decide where you should land, hopefully you've been able to do so and are able to find at least one or two lines upon which to place your name. And Chuck actually did something perfect uh, for us today, which was he drew to my attention that one of the teams that was missing was the welcoming and affirming team. And he said it needs to be done for this week, and it needed to be done for this week, and it didn't get done for this week. And he accomplished that task by putting a little extra piece of paper on that chart for us and signing his name up first. So that's another opportunity for a team for you to serve upon. Next Sunday, we have the Harriet Tubman uh, Bicentennial Celebration, the concert that is taking place here at 3 p.m., uh, we want to encourage everybody to join us, if you're able to volunteer, to help us out with uh, inviting and welcoming all kinds of folks from our community. That would be great. I am going to say, if you are volunteering, please utilize some of the parking spots either at the far end of the uh, parking lot behind Paradigm. We have to get permission to do that. Okay, we'll call them this week. And uh, hopefully be able to share some of the closer spots with those who are attending. Uh, Chuck wanted me to announce that if you have any prayer requests, you can write them on the uh, little piece of paper in the seat in front of you. Please put them into the uh, offering plate as it comes by, and that way it gets to us. And you're also welcome, if it's a uh, private prayer request, you're welcome to hand that to me following the service, and we'll certainly hold that in confidence. Thank you to everybody who was here for our gardening day yesterday. It was a fantastic time. I'm hearing people say that they're sore, which is the sign of a good three and a half hours of gardening. I am not going to name everybody who was there. It was a wide group, a large group. And if you're wondering one of the greatest discoveries, we found out that the sidewalk on this side is a good foot wider than we thought it was. <laughs> It had overgrown so much, uh, we expected to find pots of gold under it, but we didn't. But what we did discover was that we were able to work as a team and do what we could to clean up our church property in order for uh, those who are in our community in general, but also to welcome those who are here next week. There are a couple of other announcements that are in your order of service, October newsletter, and I wanted to draw to your attention a uh, particular note there for sisters in supporting, in support together, encouraging, reaffirming, and sharing, which is sisters, uh, which is a group that Jackie is facilitating. If you have any questions about that, 
please speak to her, and we really, really appreciate her leadership with that. Please take a look at the, uh, all the other announcements. There's a bunch of them in there. Take an opportunity to take the bulletin home with you, read it through, and be prepared for whatever opportunities uh, fill your heart and your time this coming week. Susan. Good morning. Good morning. Join me in the call to worship. Sheltered by God. Amen. Invited by Christ. We come now to pray. Welcomed by the Spirit. We gather as the people of God. Holy God, we come into your presence with awe and yearning. We ask you be with us this morning in some special way. We thank you for this congregation and this worship service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And let us sing. No? Well, no, we are. Okay. I, just, I just have an announcement about that. Okay. Okay. Sorry, before we sing our opening hymn, there are two things that I wanted to mention. First is a welcome to our new soprano, alto, ah, oh, it was one of four and I got it wrong, alto choral scholar, Ashley, welcome, it's great to have you with us. We've got a couple of new guests, absolutely, it is fantastic to welcome you here. We hope you find a, uh, a warm greeting and a warm welcome here this morning. The second thing is we are continuing for the time being our requirement that if you wish to sing, you have a mask on. We are hoping, hoping that that changes in the very near future and Laura Tubbs is keeping a very close eye on that and we are optimistic, but at least for the very near future, please continue to do that. I gave away my mask. That's why I'm not singing this morning. I may mouth the words. I'm not actually singing. Let's sing together. Gather us in.
Becca, are you set to read our song, or would you like me to read that? What's that? Go for it. Go for it? Okay, well, I've got it right here, so I'll go for it. Thanks, Becca. Psalm 146. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. As long as I have any being, I will sing praises to my God. Put not your trust in princes, nor in any human power, for there is no help in them. When their breath goes forth, they return to the earth. On that day, all their thoughts perish. Happy are those who have the God of Jacob for their help, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them. Keep has promise, keeps his promise forever who gives justice to those who suffer wrong, and bread to those who hunger. The Lord looses those that are bound. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the stranger in the land. The Lord upholds the orphan and the widow. But the way of the wicked will turn upside down. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, throughout all generations. Alleluia. May God add blessing to the reading of Psalm 146. We welcome our director of Next Generation Ministries, Becca. If you want me to come on up? We gave her a headset mic this week, so they're kind of complicated. We good to go? Does it work? Oh, you're ready to go. Okay, awesome. <laughs> friends, young friends, small friends, can you come close? I want to see you up close, and I have things that I think you will want to see and touch. So can you come up here? Do you mind? You don't have to, but... Y'all look great. I hope you had a good week at school. Everyone looks great, really. <laughs> Especially Mr. Lee. Oh. <laughs> Thomas. <laughs> you want to sit there? Just to hurry. You want to sit here next to the table? Just stay there. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but in the middle of the Bible is the book of Psalms. P-S-A-L-M-S. -S. Multiple silent letters, which is irritating, I know. But the book of Psalms is really a songbook, right? So for example, here's a songbook. And if you look at this closely, you can see that we have all the information that we need to be able to sing this song or play this song on a variety of instruments, right? Because we have, if you, if you are trained, right, if you've taken music classes and you've really studied this, we have the lyrics, the time signature, the key signature, the notes, the chords. So really, if we want to play this on the piano, the guitar, anything, we have it right here. Now, when I open up the Bible to the middle and I see the book of Psalms, P-S-A-L-M-S, -S, what's interesting is that I don't have the music part. I only have the words. And I used to be really disappointed by this because I thought, this is a real shame. I would be so interested to know what songs they were actually singing five, six thousand years ago, right? I would love to know the tunes that they were using. And it's kind of a letdown that I don't have that information. All I have are the words. But if you think about it a little bit, actually, maybe this is better. Maybe it's better that we only have the words because then we can make all of our own songs in any language again and again and again. 
So there are 150 poems in the Book of Psalms, right? And I can make a special song for myself from Psalm number one, and you can do it too, and it can be completely different because it could depend on what's going on inside us at that moment, our mood, our experiences. We can do different styles, we can do different languages, we can use different instruments. Do any of you play instruments? Are you studying instruments in school? No, not yet. Usually it starts in like the third or fourth or fifth grade, right? Then you get to pick an instrument that you want to study. But let's say that you really love the trombone, right? They didn't have a trombone in the Bible times, but you could write a whole bunch of trombone songs just for the songs. So in some ways, I think it's actually really, really great that we don't have the music part, but we only have the words, because then we can make up our own songs every time. And whenever you read a psalm, P-S-A-L-M, I want you to think, what kind of song would I sing? You can make up a song, just anything that comes to mind, that bubbles up in your heart, let it go, right? Just let it happen. And, um, you know, maybe not in the middle of church, like when we read together, because that would be kind of disruptive. But, you know, think about it. You can make up your own songs anytime. You know, the interesting thing is that archaeologists, do you know what archaeologists are? Have you heard that word before? Thomas, have you heard that word? Archaeologists. They are scientists who study ancient, ancient life based on the objects. They dig in the earth and they find old objects and they uh, tell us information about how people used to live. They have dug in around Israel and Palestine and they found a bunch of musical instruments. So we know the kind of instruments they used in the Bible. So Thomas, what's that thing right there? What's that? What's this? What would you call this, maybe? What would you call this? Yeah, jingle bells. We call them jingle bells, right? But this is something that they would have used in Bible times. They had stuff just like this. What about that? Here, take that pass on, right? What about this? Do you know what this is called? Tambourine. Tambourine, excellent. Good vocabulary word, right? They would have had this in Bible times too. Archaeologists have found something similar to that. They didn't have a saxophone, but they did have something that looked kind of like a flute, right? They had trumpets, and they also had like a little harp that you could hold in your lap. You love that tambourine. I'm going to have to make sure that Miss Jane has that tambourine for you to play all during Sunday school class today. They also had this instrument. Yeah, good. Can you set that down for a minute? Awesome. They also have this instrument that is called a zither. And guess what Mr. Lee has? A zither. And I'll let you come and touch this as well because it's pretty cool. This little sort of stringed instrument, you can set it on your lap. He taught himself to play this, just like probably King David did. You see, he's being King David right now. He's wearing a special reason. A lot of the Psalms, P-S-A-L-M-S, were probably written by King David, and he probably played an instrument very similar to this. All right, Mr. Lee, are you gonna, you gonna give us a sample of what it sounds like? Instrument. That one is, was made maybe 20 years ago. But it's very similar to something that existed many thousands of years ago. Do you want to touch this? Do you want to see this? So probably most of the songs in the Bible were written for something that you could play on a zither like that. Pretty cool, huh? It's kind of tough on your fingers. This, this string is tough. 
probably in the old days they would have been made from animal skins or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I want you to always remember that when you hear a song being read, it was originally a song. And you can make a song that brings joy to your heart or that brings you peace and comfort anytime. Maybe not in the middle of church when we're all reading together, but especially when you're reading at home. Okay? We're going to go study a new song today. Last week we did number 23. This week we're going to do another number. Pick a number between 1, one and 150. Anyone, anyone, one and 150. 75. No, we're doing 91, but good, good guess. <laughs> okay, we're doing Psalm 91 today. It's a great one, you're gonna love it. All right, are you ready? Let's go, let's go back. Okay. Thanks, Sister Lee. Do you wanna play that later? You can ask him to play it later, it's pretty cool. Right? What? Thanks, Ms. Becca, and as our and Lee, thank you for. That was because I told him he wasn't allowed to wear a toga. <laughs> Let's sing together number 408, The Gift of Love, number 408. To 1961. We pick up our journey in Christian education from 1931 to 1961 in April of 1944 
when Miss Moore reported that attendance was showing a strong upturn since the new point system had started, and likewise there had been a very positive response church-wide to the new church school time. She also introduced what she titled a Grand and Specific Aims for LABC Church School 1944 to 1945 that included a revised budget, vacation Bible school, children's day planning, church school workers convocation, rally day and promotion day, and a new leadership course. Shortly thereafter came the resignation of Earl Davis, chair of the church picnic committee, and he said this, under the present wartime conditions, we cannot justify ourselves in the outlay of gasoline, food, and other supplies that will be necessary for such an undertaking. Also, the resultant publicity, in my opinion, will react unfavorably towards our church, as we are precedent setters in the church field. Much time will be taken away from war work by a good many people to carry through such a program, and at this time, it can ill be spared. As a result, the church picnic in 1944 and all departmental picnics were cancelled that year. In 1946, things picked up when Rev. Stanley Borden became assistant pastor at LABC. He reported on building changes that were nearing the completion at the end of summer and also suggested that the church school board adopt a committee that was forming a number of different committees, the Visitation Committee, the Personnel Committee, a Curriculum Committee, and a Teacher Training Committee. In May of 1948, the Church School Constitution was revised, making a significant change in how classes were organized. In October of 1948, the Newlyweds Club asked to begin a Sunday evening group. In January 1949, plans were laid to hold a 10-week teacher training program. It would begin with the kindergarten. Twenty parents would be contacted to see if they would allow their children to participate in a class that would be used as a model for the training. This class would be taught by the trainees under the supervision of the program's professional leadership. And even though the church school constitution had been revised in 1948, it was once again revised in 1949, and the major change was the definition of church school. The significance of this change is that it signals the beginnings of the integration between the Sabbath school, or church school, or Sunday school entity that had begun in 1865, and the church entity, which was founded in 1871. For 84 years, the two had operated cooperatively, but independently. And a few months later, at the August board meeting, it was noted that the kindergarten attendance had become too large for the space that was allotted to it. Therefore, that kindergarten class was divided into two classes. This was a precursor to what would come. The boomers were on their way and would necessitate significant changes well into the 1960s. And it was finally at the August 14, 1950 meeting that the funds of the Lake Avenue Memorial Church School were consolidated with the funds of the Lake Avenue Baptist Memorial Church and Society, and the two entities were officially made one. Here we have Miss Anderson, who was hired to help in the church school to be paid along with other student ministers. By March of 1951, it was reported that Mr. Bentley's Saturday afternoon basketball program was flourishing. The intent of this program was to meet the needs for the neighborhood boys. In September of 1951, Mr. Borden introduced Donald Deere, a new student at CRDS, who came to work with the youth and taught the 11th and 12th grade mixed church school class. Here we have the 1951-1952 Board of Education. Here we have a picture of our nursery kids. It's also interesting that at the April meeting of the board, Mr. Borden reported that the church school broadcast on the second Sunday of each month was reaching an estimated 57,000 folk, which compared favorably to the big time broadcasts. From the beginning of the Fairport Baptist Home, Different entities within the church fostered relationships with that ministry. 
in particular the Women's Mission Society, but also the church school, which presented programs and visited residents. By January 1954, the idea of having a general council of representatives made up of a representative from each of the church boards or entities was raised. The council would act as a coordinating or planning agency for the discussion and problems as they arose. It was decided that the Board of Education would carry this idea forward to the other entities. This was beginning of what was called a church council. At the September 1954 board meeting, Dr. Hill announced that Reverend Herbert Grant had accepted the call to become the Director of Religious Education at LABC. Reverend Grant would begin his ministry in early 1955. One of his first tasks was to bring the children's story during worship on January 16th. This was the beginning of the children's story time in worship at LABC. At the April meeting, Dr. Bevan showed a film strip on the Year of Baptist Advancement, which was a program of the Northern Baptist Convention, which was a denominational-wide program, and he encouraged the board to participate. A motion was made, and the program was heartily recommended to the advisory board of the church, and the program would take place from 1955 to 1956. Here we have a number of materials from that church year, including a list of major activities, a message to the teachers, responsibilities of the Children's Work Committee, as well as an attendance advancement record, and an attachment that was used to keep track of families. Ms. Sita Allen reported to the board on all of those who attended the various camps during the summer. And on Sunday, October 30th, the annual service of dedication for church school workers was conducted during the regular morning service. And finally, we have an image here of a neighborhood service project. Though we may lack photos, we have a lot of information about things that took place during that particular time, both within the church and within the broader community. We thank those who have gone before us for their efforts in this ministry. Let us continue in our time of worship today. The morning offering will be received, and if you're visiting with us today, your presence here this day is your offering.
Thank you, Kadesh. Kadesh is shared from 1 Timothy 6, 6 to 19. But godliness without content with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap that, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, child of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you have been called when you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you, 
to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings, Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. Command those who are rich in the present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides them with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. May God add blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let us pray. God of love, may the word of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. In your name we pray. Amen. This past week, I watched some of the devastation from Hurricane Fiona that went up the east coast of Canada. And it brought back for me, and I know for my mother, memories of when they were living, my parents were living in Halifax during Hurricane Juan. And my mother recounts the story of spending a couple of days in this bathroom on the inside of their basement without any windows with their kind of survival stuff while the wind battered their homes about outside. And she said that living through that gives her a greater sensitivity to what the people are going through right now. And so I went to the news this morning and I saw an image of a blue house that was being carried out into the ocean. The foundation of that house wasn't firm. That house that had been built up did not have something going down into its, its foundation to hold it there. It was just sitting on a rock. So even in the midst of thinking that rock will provide the greatest foundation for all things, if the, what is built up is not connected to what is there, it doesn't even matter, as this image showed. And this took me back 25 years ago. So I want to set the stage for it. Edmonton, Alberta, so Western Alberta, straight north of Montana, Washington kind of area, has a river valley that runs through it, a huge river valley. And the most desired homes are on the top of that river valley, looking down into the river below and then out towards the, the vision of the city with all of its skyscrapers and such. That's where the wealthy want to live. And it was about 25 years ago that the story first hit the newspaper of five houses that were built up on that river valley. Beautiful, beautiful mansions, millions of dollars. And this was 25 years ago. And the ground between the foundation and the river valley started to crumble. Week by week, rain by rain, and that house that might have been 20 feet back from the river valley became 15 feet back. 10, five. And the news cameras set up their cameras across the river from these houses to watch what would happen, to watch that inevitable. And in time, it happened. This million dollar home, this three million, four million dollar home, fell a few hundred feet into the river valley below. Gone. Because the foundation what was holding it to the ground was not firm, but rather everything above ground looked wonderful. The wealth, the power, everything that that house symbolized looked fantastic from the ground up. 
But what was really important for it was missing. It didn't have that strong connection that it needed. The ground around it had not been paid particular attention. Because word came out eventually that they were told when they were building, this is not a good place to build these homes. But their desire for privilege and wealth and power and, and everything people would see was more important than focusing on what would keep it rooted. And by the way, no insurance covered it. And I tell you this because I think in many ways that's what the text is talking to us about. Our reading from 1 Timothy. Now, it's interesting because this is one of those readings that's so easy to pass by. Because when we look at it, when we look at this text, it's so easy for us to get caught in what we think it's about. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into the world, let's take nothing out of it. You might have heard that. Maybe at a funeral. Said quite often. And then we get into this part about this text that talks about wealth. And this is the part where particularly people in the West get really nervous. It's the kind that makes them kind of, oh, wait a second, you mean I can't have the money that I have? And they, they may shut their minds off because they think they know what the text is about and therefore by shutting themselves off to what they don't want to hear, they miss so many of the other good nuggets that are embedded within this text. So I'm going to skip right past the stuff on wealth. I want to get to particular verse. I want to get particularly to verse 11 and 12. But before I get there, let's just do a bit, bit of a reminder. Just a bit of a reminder of who Timothy was. He was that man from Lystra, that city in the Roman province of Galatia. And Paul led Timothy to Christ and, and kind of took him with him on his journeys, on his missionary journeys. He was very young at that age, maybe 15 or 16, but he had a very good reputation. And so Paul wanted to work with this young man to kind of raise him up in his experience as a missionary, as someone sharing this message of Christ. And so Timothy stayed with Paul. He learned from Paul. He got experience from Paul. And he was with him in the good times and the bad times. He was with Paul when Paul was in jail. He was often sent as Paul's representative when Paul couldn't go himself. And Timothy himself became imprisoned somewhere at some time and was eventually released. And so these pastoral epistles are good advice from Paul to Timothy. And like so many of those other pastoral epistles that we, that we know about in so many of the books of the New Testament, they were meant to be shared. They were, they were the kind of thing that would come from one person to another and then eventually get their hands into the hands of others and share and be spread around as good words to remember. And I think in many ways it makes sense that they come to us today. There are advice from Paul to Timothy about things to keep in mind in his own ministry, in the ministry of the early church and also in our ministry. So as I say, the first bits deal with true riches. First, the author describes behavior that provides contentment. Mentions things, though, that lead to temptation. Then he gives that further ethical, that good advice. And that's where we land today. So let's focus on verse 11 and 12. He offers Timothy and each of us things that we can and should aim for in faithful and obedient lives. In other words, if we choose to focus on what really roots us into that ground rather than focusing just on the, the visual things, the, the pat on our own back kind of things, these are, are a few of the things that are worth mentioning. Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. These are the things that are necessary. First, righteousness. And the Greek word for righteousness in a more broad sense means the state of one 
as things ought to be, a condition that is acceptable to God. Things like integrity, virtue, purity of life, rightness, correctness in thinking, feeling, and acting. Righteousness is one of those things that we are called upon to pursue, and I think this is interesting. In the Word of Life Study Bible, it says this. Righteousness goes back to a base meaning word, meaning move in a straight line. Thus, righteousness, rightness, means in the straight or the right way, often used with mortality, or morality, I should say. Righteousness means living or acting in the right way. Now, the challenge is in our society, what's the right way? People commonly say that what builds me up, what's right for me, is the right way. However, Scripture has a slightly different standard. The ultimate standard is God, God's self. God's character reveals what is absolutely right. That measure of right and wrong. So to live in righteousness, to, to live in rightness, to move in that straight line is to keep our eyes fixed not on our own selves, but on God's self. To live in a way in which we feel that God would be wanting us to live, to pursue that high standard. Righteousness. Second is godliness, which refers to reverence, respect, and piety toward God. If we revere God, if we respect God, we will desire to live godly lives. Godliness is essential in our own lives to be a testimony to others in the world, not of ourselves, but for the glory of God. Godliness. That next quality is faith. Better translated here as faithfulness or fidelity. When we trust Christ, when we make a decision at whatever point in our lives to seek to follow Christ, it should be our desire and our commitment to not stray. That's what's involved in mentioning that pursuit of faith. This is what he's talking about. And next we see Paul encouraging Timothy to pursue love. John talks about the importance of love. And it's that critical passage that we hear about so often. By this you will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So remember, this isn't that erotic kind of love. It's that relationship, that relationship with God and with one another. So are we practicing love for others? Practicing love for others is a discipline, something to work towards. Are we practicing love so much so that it comes naturally from us, that it flows from our lives into the world? Love. And after that, Paul suggests and encourages and focuses upon pursuing endurance. Endurance here is that characteristic that one is not swerved from that deliberate purpose, that straight line, that devotion of faith through the trials and the tribulations and the sufferings of the world. Because our Christian walk will be one that needs endurance. I've said it before, I'll say it again, just by choosing to follow Christ doesn't mean everything's going to get great. I wish it does, but it doesn't. Our journey with Christ is not one that will be without difficulty. The idea here, this idea of endurance is hanging on even when things get difficult. It's that refusal to give up even when things are difficult. And the final characteristic that Paul encourages Timothy to pursue is gentleness. 
That attitude of gentleness gives us a balance in our lives. Gentleness helps us to speak the truth in love even when it's difficult. But it also gives us advice on how to live in relationship with others, sharing love in difficult circumstances. That idea of gentleness will help us return to that soft answer in response to harsh words. And again, going back to that need for endurance, there will be harsh words as people living in faith. Pursuing righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Those are the things that help us to, to be truly embedded in the ground, not focused just on what is above, but what is deeply rooted as people of faith. So to close, it's easy to skip past the stuff in Scripture that we don't like. It's easy to get to this particular text and say, okay, this is the text on wealth, and I don't really want to hear that, so let's go to some. Can we read a gospel? Can we go to something else that's a little more palatable for me? But when we do that, I think we really miss some of the important messages that these Scriptures can teach us. So if we skip past the stuff in this text about wealth and think that we want to put it aside, we run the risk of missing this kind of text, which really gives us some insights about how we are called to live as people of faith. If you doubt when I say how important it is to be rooted, to be grounded, to be embedded in something of value, just think about those houses that we see that are washed away in the hurricanes. When the tough winds come, and they will, things that are not rooted deeply, and connected, and held with something more than just the beauty of what is above, will face the challenges and struggle to persevere. Think about that story I told about the houses that fell into the river valley. They looked great from up above, but they were missing something, something more deeply rooted. Think back to this text. Paul shares with Timothy, with Timothy some great advice, and that which we might be encouraged to hear. How to live lives of faith that basis of a firm foundation. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. In doing these things, we pray that we might live with the foundation of faith. Let us pray. Susan?
we praise the church teachers and assistants who teach us. We are grateful for our freedom to worship you in so many ways. We praise those who honor freedom of religion. We are grateful for all the riches you bestow upon us. May we spread all of our bounty on others. This morning we pray for those who are homeless, without food or shelter. We pray that their needs be fulfilled. We pray for our Hispanic neighbors who celebrate their heritage. May we celebrate with them. We pray for the addicted and mentally ill. May they find healthy sources of their, in their lives. Lord, our world is so full of beauty, mystery, and awesome. Pledge to work diligently to treat living creatures gently, to reduce pollution in whatever way we as individuals can do. We also pledge to work with our governments to clean up our environment. And we pray for those who are currently threatened by storms and weather, by floods, fires, and hurricanes in Puerto Rico, the Pacific. Islands and California. We pledge, Lord, to have our strong base based on you. We are together as your people to build the strong base of our faith. May we pursue, pursue righteousness, love, gentleness, and peace. May we receive with gratitude and humility the gifts you shower upon us. May those who are rich be rich in giving, richly speaking out the truth. We are your people, and we are fighting the good fight to uphold and be led by pray in the name of Jesus as we pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from
join with me for our responsive benediction and blessing printed in your order of service. May we be rich in good things, attending to the poor and caring for those in need. May we be generous with our lives, giving treasure and time to make the world a better place. May we take hold of what is truly life, the goodness of God flowing in us Go with the peace, the joy, and the love of Christ that flows through you into the world so desperately in need. Go in love.